Okay, we'll go ahead and call to order the meeting of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners for Friday, June 21st, 2019. Commissioner Cavillo, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> we get a roll call of the commission please chairman johnston here vice chairman valentine here commissioner Almberg. Here. commissioner barnes here. commissioner cavilia here. commissioner east commissioner hubs here. commissioner keel here. commissioner mcninch here. and i did receive some communication from commissioner east earlier this week uh she is uh an excused absence from this meeting this weekend due to some family uh, circumstances that require her attention. Uh, would the county advisory boards who are present please announce themselves? Paul Dixon Park, Ben McElvey, Lyon County. Glenn Bunch, Mel. Rob Jacobson, Lyon. Steve Marcus, my fine. Mike Reese, Park. Joe Krim, Pershing. Chrissy Polk, Nye. King Green, Carson Steve Robinson, Washoe. Ray Kamish, Washoe. Thank you all. Uh, just very briefly before we move on, there is a uh, field trip tour, for lack of a better term, uh, during the course of this meeting later today. Uh, everyone is welcome to attend. If you are going to go on Mount Grant in that segment, you need to make sure, if you have not already, complete the background check form. I believe Miss Bunch, sitting back at the bar here, has those forms to be completed. Uh, people will, however, need to be able to provide their own uh, transportation. In addition, I'd please remind everybody to sign in uh, to the sign-in sheet if you're in attendance in today's meeting. Anything on that particular issue, Secretary Wasley? Okay, thank you. With that, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Chairman Johnston for possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. Any comments or questions on the agenda? Any public comment on the agenda? And we are not video conferenced or telephone conferenced to any other location, correct? Thank you. Any public comment on the agenda here in Hawthorne? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. Yes, uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the agenda as presented today by the department. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hub, seconded by Commissioner McNinch to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0 with Commissioner East absent. Moving on to agenda item number three, approval of minutes. Chairman Johnston for possible action. Commission minutes from the April 8th, 2019 and May 3rd and 4th, 2019 meetings. So everyone had a chance to review the mi minutes from those two meetings. Any comments? Seeing none, any public comment on the minutes from either the, the April 8th or May 3rd and 4th commission meetings? Mm -hmm. Seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioner Hubbs. I was reviewing um, the May minutes, uh, and I was looking at page 36, and of course this had to do with the bear hunt. One of the issues that stood out to me was there was a question I proposed as to whether or not the bear hunt was used at, as a management tool. And I was speaking with, I'm going to draw a blank on his name, the biologist. Pat Jackson? Yes, Pat Jackson. I remember him saying that it was not, and in the notes it said yes, that it was used as a management tool for the bear population. He stated, 
he provided that yes, hunting is necessary to manage black bear population levels. I, I believe he said it is not, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Now, if I misunderstood him, or does anyone else remember that? I remember the conversation. I don't remember what the specific response was. I remember that he gave some input in response to your question. Um, I do, I think, remember the is not having an impact, positive or negative. That's right. That's what was the first comment as was for. for. As for, so as for the remaining part, I don't recall. The second sentence doesn't go along with that concept. So I just was thinking it might have been misquoted on record. Um, would that be something the department could do? Would re review the uh, the video and audio recording of the meeting, make sure that that is accurate or is fixed to be accurate, and perhaps well, then we can defer the May third and fourth meeting minutes until August. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page twenty-eight, there's a reference to. Uh, no building. Um, it, it indicates uh, uh, representing the Washoe Cab. Um, I believe he was probably speaking as a member of the public on Washoe County. Okay. All right. To just I guess that clarification. Any other comments to the minutes? Any comments to the April minutes? Seeing none, I'd make a motion to approve the minutes from the April 8th, 2019 meeting as presented. I'll second. Everyone clear on that motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. And then we'll defer uh, action on the May 3rd and 4th meeting minutes until our next meeting to get clarification. And I think what we'd like to do is let's fix the issue that Commissioner McNinch identified as well regarding Mr. Belding as a resident of Washoe County not representing the cab. Okay? Yes? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, just um, certainly uh, at the discretion of the, the DAG, I did uh, query uh, Mr. Jackson as to his answer uh, to that question. Um, and his recollection is that he said no, uh, that he was asked if it was needed as a management tool, and he said no. So if, if that is adequate clarification and would allow for the approval of the minutes today, we could do so. If in an abundance of caution you want to wait and have us listen to that audio and reflect it um, as indicated by the audio, we can do that as well. That's sufficient for me if it's sufficient for everyone else. Commissioner Hubbs, would you perhaps entertain a motion then on the May minutes? Let me just go back to the dates here. Do you have them in front of me? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes um, as presented by the department for the May 3rd and 4th meetings with the exception as to page 36 um, where Pat Jackson stated that uh, the hun hunting was not a management tool for bear populations instead of him stating that it was a management tool for the bear population. Additionally, um, I'd like to um, make changes as to Mel Belding. Um, he was speaking individually on behalf of himself instead of as a member of, Washoe of the Washoe Cab.
I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Hubbs, seconded by Commissioner Valentine, to approve the May 3rd and May 4th meeting minutes uh, with the changes she noted. Everybody clear on the motion? Yeah. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. With Commissioner East absent. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number four, member items, announcements, and correspondence, Chairman Johnston, informational. Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide ha ha hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wosley may also be discussed. Um, I'll just start off. Uh, I provided to uh, Secretary Wosley the letter that I penned and sent regarding the Silver State Trail. That was something that we did at the uh, last commission meeting. So if anyone wants to see that, Commissioner Wosley has a copy. Uh, I want to thank the department for assisting me in getting that finalized and, and out. Uh, I believe I also received some correspondence on um, shed hunting. Um, that continues to be an issue percolating, um, especially on the eastern side of the state. Uh, some people expressing their frustrations over the shed hunting regulations. Um, I had some conversations uh, with individuals after the last meeting on the U hunt issue. Um, and I can say that I've asked the department for two agenda items at future meetings. Uh, one will be on uh, deer quotas and quota settings, a, a, an opportunity for us to look at that issue uh, in more detail, management guidelines and that, what are being used to set the quota. And the request is that that may be done in the August meeting in Ely with the hope that we can have a more thorough discussion as part of the CAB workshop on that issue uh, separate and apart from the quota setting because the quota setting meeting in my mind is just not the place where you have the time and ability to engage in that overview. Um, the idea is to have a, an analysis or a presentation on alternatives to you hunts, the necessary for necessity of them at the September meeting down in Las Vegas. Um, the other member item announcements that I have uh, I've just, uh, I thought it was very interesting. I got a, a new phone. It's a Google phone, so it pops up on a page like stories they think I'd be interested in. So I get a lot of um, hunting articles. Uh, but I was reading one with interest I just wanted to share. It talked about do-it-yourself hunts. And as you went through the list, it gave different options. And then it said the holy grail of the do-it-yourself hunts and tags that you can draw and one of the three that was listed was the Desert Bighorn Tag in Nevada. I thought that was an excellent uh, uh, way to, to note that what we have here in Nevada. And then I'll also things, I think with some of the issues that we've discussed time and time again here, I would encourage everyone to read the various articles and opinion pieces on what, ha what is happening in the country of Botswana right now in terms of reopening that country, the arguments for and against, and the debate that's going on on many of the issues that we have, even though it's very, very far away. So that's all that I have. Any other member items or announcements? With that, we'll on to agenda item number five, county advisory boards to manage wildlife member items. Information. Cab members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item scheduled on a future commission agenda. Any For the record, uh, Paul Dixon, Clark. Um, Meeting and I put on my action report 
and Dow and commission consideration. The first one is the a member of the trappers that raised concerns about the uh, questionnaire, the electronic questionnaire, and the ability for trappers out there to fill that out efficiently without going to the Endow office. And I was wondering, because they used to have an all paper copy, now it's electronic, some people don't have things, whether the department or other things was working with the Trappers Association to make sure that we get something that they're filling out and can fill out simply, because right now they seem to be struggling, at least that was the testimony at my CAB meeting. Second thing is, is uh, there were some concerns raised by some people. We have new legislation in Nevada coming out of this legislature of what impacts does that have on hunting, fishing, and the carrying of firearms around our state, um, and whether or not we need to do public outreach or an educational thing on that. People were asking about impacts of that with this new legislature because there's lots of rumors, and I didn't have answers at the time. The third thing is, is that um, the address for the um, for the license office for fur dealers still continues to be incorrect on the web and I made a comment it still has a Kinski Lane address and so people who are fur dealers are actually going to the website and applying to this address which is not going anywhere because it doesn't we're not even forwarded mail from that address anymore so I would ask the department I'll hand this over make sure that they get that web piece cleaned up on their on their website thank you For the record, Ted McElvain, Leonard County Cab. Mr. Johnston Commission, I provided everybody with a um, letter from the Leonard, Leonard County Cab. And uh, concerned, the, there's been some uh, public comment in Leonard County in regards to smart scopes. And they asked the board, uh, has, it been, has it been addressed or has it been brought to the commission as far as the Leonard County Cab? We was not aware um, if it had been or what. So we're just bringing, basically bringing it as an informational. I'll read through the letter here real fast that the Atlanta County Cab has presented. The Atlanta County Cab has discussed, researched, and voted in favor of looking at some limitation concerning smart scopes during the inter, any legal weapons hunting season in the state of Nevada. Technologies continue to advance at a rapid pace into all aspects of life, including the world of hunting. As this technology advances in the hunting world, the wildlife continues to live in the same yet struggling habitat that it has for years, decades, even centuries. At our disposable, we now have scopes available that with the push of a button will range the intended target, gauge wind speed, process this information, and eliminate it and eliminate it an aiming point which matches the ballistics from information we have, um, we have loaded in the scope. We believe that this is hunters and conservation technologists has reached a point that needs us to stand up and determine a cap on the advancement and its use in the hunting world. In the name of Fair Chase, we feel a need to begin discussion and hopefully action on the issue of smart scopes for hunting purposes in the state of Nevada. And this is basically focused toward um, the any legal weapon because muzzle loader, you know, you can't use a scope, you know. There's um, one of the things that was brought up by one of the um, public was, you know, the commission and um, Endow did something about the um, smart cameras. You know, they're only used for a certain amount of time. So it was just something to bring on the radar and see if anybody has, if it's really there. So, thank you. Commissioner Rob Jacobson for uh, Lyon County Cab. We had, uh, uh, we were contacted by some people that were, went shed hunting opening morning and as they're driving up the canyon they met a truck loaded with sheds coming out and we just think there needs to be some greater teeth in caching and going out, uh, also driving off road. Um, they're not afraid of the punishment and we think we need to look at ramping up um, the consequences to make it less attractive to cheat. Thank you. For the record, Chrissy Pope, my county cap. Um, this is also regarding the shed hunting. Um, where this year we had some problems in Nye County. Um, we also saw a truck coming out of the canyon because me and my family, we go out and pick up sheds and stuff like that. But um, we also saw a truck. Wasn't able to get a license plate or I would have gladly turned it in, but there are issues out there and um, 
we would like to see if we can get this back on the agenda and maybe discuss some things. Um, the biggest part is these people are coming over from Utah. You know, how are we, we don't necessarily want to stop them or anything, but their season um, opens up April 15th. Why is ours the 30th? Um, they should not be able to pick up their sheds two weeks before they can come over to Nevada and pick up ours. So um, they're actually, you know, bringing people in, they're gathering them up so that they can just pull in, pick them up and leave because of course there's money on those farms and stuff. So um, this is an issue that Nye County is um, having right now. So we just want to see if maybe we can address this in a future meeting and maybe we wouldn't even be opposed to having them buy a hunting license for Nevada. So it's just an idea. Thank you. Thank you. Additional cab items. Good morning. Uh, Steve Marcus, White Pine. Uh, for the last two meetings, we have had shed discussions, shed season discussions. Um, from what we were told, uh, Elko County Cab and Jim Cooney sent us a petition for adoption, amendment, filing, or repeal of regulation. We thought they were going to bring this forward today. We did look over their proposed amendments and recommendations. Um, I guess we have to wait for them to bring it forth. Um, but going with what the other two caps have stated, um, we feel also there needs to be, in the law, it does not address stashing or um, caching antlers, and we did have that problem out there. Um, we, we do realize that Endow was out there, and there were some citation, citations issued, which did curb it, but still, we do have people just totally coming in, and still, it, it's still a problem. Um, and we, we know where we want to go with this. We do want stiffer penalties. Um, and uh, we thought about an ethics course. And so much, you can't legislate ethics. All you can do is try to teach ethics. Um, but it would give us a number of, we knew how many people took the ethics course, how many people were coming in. And that could give us maybe a little bit of information as to what we could go forward with. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any additional cab items? Seeing none, we'll close that agenda item. Secretary Iwazi, can you refresh my recollection? The smart scopes, that regulation did go through and is now law, correct? Apparently, uh, there's a distinction between smart rifles and smart scopes. And that regulation uh, that was passed dealt with smart weapons, the smart rifles. and. Uh, we can have Chief Warden Turnipsey add some clarification there, um, but I, I believe that the smart scopes are still legal. Thank you, Chairman Johnston, members of the Commission, uh, Chief Game Warden Tyler Turnipsey, for the record. Um, Director Wosley is exactly right. The, the regulation we addressed or, and adopted two years ago now um, specifically talks about those smart scopes that are then directly tied to the firing mechanism. Um, smart rifles, I guess, for lack of a better term. If it doesn't have that connection to the firing mechanism, then they're still legal. I think uh, some of the, a lot of the companies now have come out with a scope that does the range finding inside the scope and uh, adjusts accordingly. But uh, the regulation that we adopted two years ago, if that's not then digitally connected to the trigger, it's still legal. Right now it just says if it doesn't cast a visible beam, it's legal, so certainly something that this board could address, but uh, as of right now, they're, they're wide open. I guess it's another example. The technology keeps evolving, and you think you've addressed something, and they find uh, the, the next best thing to, to address. Okay, yeah, I thank you for that. I will make a note for future agenda items. <coughs> With that, we'll move on, unless there are any other comments, to agenda item number six, presentation in Nevada Test and Training Range in the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. Deputy Project Leader Kevin DeRoberts, I hope I pronounced that correctly. For information only, the Commission will be providing an update on the Nevada Test and Training Range withdrawal renewal pertaining to the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, introduce Mr. DeRoberts. Uh, 
He's the deputy project leader for the Desert, Desert National Wildlife <coughs> Refuge. Uh, the Department, Nevada Department of Wildlife has a, a very strong uh, and, and long uh, relationship with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and particularly at the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. It was originally created for the purpose of uh, sheep, bighorn sheep protection. Um, and Kevin uh, had expressed a willingness to provide an update given uh, the attention that this item has received. Uh, certainly at the most recent uh, legislative session uh, through CAB uh, agenda items and, and this board, uh, we jumped at the chance to, to have Kevin come in and kind of present an update to, to this body and, and the interested public in attendance. So with that, Kevin. Thank and thank you. you very much for the opportunity. Um, hopefully this works. I worked earlier. Short power. It'll probably work as long as I'm not the one that has to operate. Chairman. Chairman Johnston, Commissioners, uh, Director Wozley, thank you again for the opportunity to just provide an update on um, where we're at with um, Wildlife Refuge in regards to the proposed um, withdrawal um, extension and expansion of the Nevada Testing Training Range. So I'll just do a brief history to get started. As many of you know, um, Desert Wildlife Refuge created in 1936, um, largest refuge in the lower 48 states, over 1.5 million acres. It is our largest intact habitat left for desert bighorn sheep. Very critical for bighorn sheep, as, as Director Wozley mentioned, as well as hundreds of other wildlife species. And also, it is overlapped by the Nevada Test and Training Range, which that is the, the current range, um, our current boundary of the Nevada Test and Training Range, about 2.9 million acres. Um, and you can see the south range overlaps that western portion of the refuge, approximately 842,000 acres. And these are the, the current operation areas. Um, you can see that the black dots throughout that map, north and south range, are targets that are out there. And this is from their, <coughs> the Air Force's documents provided in the legislative EIS. And then down on the lower portion of the south range that overlaps the refuge, you can see those um, they're kind of white boundary areas. Um, those are called the target impact areas. And combined, those are about 112,000 acres. So during the last withdrawal in 97, um, Air Force was given primary jurisdiction for those areas because that's where they've been bombing since the 40s, since World War II. So Congress gave them primary jurisdiction of those areas to continue bombing. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service has primary jurisdiction of the all the other land outside those impact areas on the NTTR. But the Air Force does control access because of safety and security reasons. So just a refresher um, on the alternatives in the legislative EIS that the Air Force has presented. Um, alternative one would be the status quo. So the current situation, no changes in jurisdiction or size of the range. Alternative two, would extend the existing withdrawal, but also provide ready access throughout the whole range. And that includes the desert wildlife refuge. So instead of um, primary jurisdiction for fish and wildlife service in, the, in that portion that we have now, all that would become primary jurisdiction Air Force. And the purpose for that is ready access and to accommodate a, like a 30% increase in training, um, which includes um, not only aerial training, but also on the ground training exercises with uh, equipment, vehicles, personnel, and also the installation of thread emitters, those sorts of things. So landscape impact changes. But right now you don't have those impacts. If you were, I don't know if anybody has hunted on that portion of the refuge, but if you were to go out there, 
pretty much everything outside that 112,000 acre impact area um, is relatively pristine landscape. It's pretty much untouched. And then alternative three um, contains a couple, or con has a couple, several alternatives. And um, 3A, 3A1, 3B, and 3C. And 3B and 3C are the primary ones that impact uh, the refuge. And I'll go on to the map next to show you where those are at. And then also um, alternative four, which is the withdrawal period and the Air Force is proposing a permanent withdrawal, indefinite. And just to highlight, um, so their, their alternatives are alternative two, 3A1, 3B, 3C, and then 4C combined. That's what they're, that's what they're proposing to Congress. And there's a map of those um, proposed alternatives with the expansion areas. And if you look at the, the desert refuge portion down at the, the lower right part of the screen, there's that chunk of the refuge at the southwest corner that's about 36,000 acres that's currently outside the range that would be included, which is bighorn sheep habitat. And then also the expansion on the east side, that whole that aqua colored shade, that's the Alamo expansion area. It's about 226,000 acres. So that would extend the range into the sheep range. So the Nevada Testing Crane Ridge would extend into the sheep range and all that area would become closed to the public. So not only for, for hunting, well, except for hunting, but for all of our other public uses, that would be closed. And then for bighorn sheep hunting, we'd have the same restriction that we have on the west side right now. So instead of a full one month season, it goes to two week season. And also, um, with that Alamo expansion, they want to add, of course, mo more training opportunities on the ground, training opportunities, also the installation of emitters, and also the landing of aircraft on the Desert Dry Lake. And there's another smaller dry lake just to the northwest of the Desert Dry Lake um, that they're calling austere uh, landing strips to land aircraft, um, take off and landings like over 500 a year. So out there, it, it, it changed it dramatically. And also included um, would be the installation of fences where they need to install them to keep the public out. So where are we now? Um, <clears throat> so right now, uh, we've been told that the Department of Defense is drafting the legislation for Congress for the, the renewal and the expansion of the MTTR. Um, and also, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Park Service is currently um, developing findings and recommendations, and these have to be done by the end of this month. And those will be submitted through our respective agencies through to the headquarters office in DC, um, and then the agencies will conduct briefings with the Department of Interior. So we're still, um, I've drafted the ones for Desert Refuge, and they're still they're currently being reviewed by our regional director. So hopefully that'll happen um, within what has to be happening by next week um, that gets finalized. And the Park Service has finalized theirs. BLM is still having theirs reviewed by the state director. Um, but then that'll go to uh, DC and start moving up the chain there. And then next, um, in the past, DOD has invited the DOI agencies to provide input on the legislation. That hasn't happened yet, but it, it's supposed to happen. So we're hoping to see that happen later in the year. And then by January 2020, that's when um, the Office of Management and Budget circulates the draft legislation for interagency inter review. So it should go through BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Park Service to review that legislation again. And then the Secretaries of Interior and the Air Force submit it to Congress by May of next year. Because we've been told that um, this has to be included in the fiscal year 2021 budget in order for the NDA to, or in order for the NTTR withdrawal to be um, extended. So that's their timeline. They have to get this done. And the drop dead date is December of 2020. So it's, it's quite the process and, and uh, we're working closely with the solicitor's office and, and Department of Interior BLM to try to stay on top of this. And also, and I don't want to keep folks up to speed too as we move forward. But, um, We'll see what happens. And as everybody knows, there's been a lot of um, opposition to any changes in 
in the NTTR um, by the public, both in Nevada and throughout the country. So um, we're not sure where Congress is going to go. We have got no indication of where Congress might go on this. So. But um, a couple key things uh, with Department of Interior, um, two of the major priorities um, that this proposal um, kind of goes against is uh, public access is a huge priority for Secretary of Interior as well as migration corridors for large animals, big game animals. And um, this is a very, very critical um, situation for bighorn sheep on desert refuge. Because we're already um, concerned about potential impacts with bighorn sheep movements between mountain ranges on the west side as it is because of the infrastructures in between the ranges. And we're concerned about how that might impact sheep movements from the sheep range to the desert range and further to the west. Um, also, and then with access for the public. And before I go into some additional updates, um, in addition to uh, the hunting access, a lot of people access the east side of the refuge for hiking, backpacking, camping. It's also very important for our tribes, um, the Wubi, the Southern Paiute people. There's a lot of cultural resources that they access on a frequent basis. Um, and also bighorn sheep is very important to them as well. It's a, it's a very powerful spiritual animal for the tribes. And so we're, we're everybody's kind of in this together and um, it's, it's been pretty amazing. So, but it's also, it's, it's also quite concerning. So some additional updates I just want to bring up to, to you is um, our vacant wildlife biology position. Uh, Sarah Bullock went to BLM last summer and we had submitted our recruitment package in fall of last year, but it, it got kind of pulled into this national hiring initiative that has been occurring the last couple months and um, interviews have been conducted for that position and hopefully someone will be hired within the next month or so and something arriving by August or September. So it's, it's taken a full year, just amazing how long it takes to fill a vacancy. Very frustrating. And then the, the complex project leader, um, Christy Smith retired in December of last year and that position is being filled. I think they're starting interviews next week. And then another um, issue I want to bring to your attention is the, the Brent's seat guzzler, which is on the west side of the refuge in the NTTR overlay portion. And I'll bring up a map in a minute up to show you what it looks like. Um, last November, we, we were told by the Air Force that Fish and Wildlife Service and NDOW would no longer be able to access that guzzler, as well as that area would be close to bighorn sheep hunting. Because it's now, um, it's restricted because of what's happening to the north in Area 51. It's like we're seeing this creep from Area 51 south onto the refuge that's impacting management of the refuge, access for hunting, and also to this guzzler. And um, so this spring was developed in 2002, and then um, a collection storage system was improved by Endow Fish and Wildlife Service and the Paternity of Bighorn Sheep. And in 2010, uh, major investments were made with a new apron and tank system by Nevada Bighorns Unlimited Fraternity and Down Fish and Wildlife Service. So this has major implications. And I'll point it out because it's hard to see on this map. So Brent Seat is way up here in this end of the, this is the desert range that comes up. That's right, it's the northern portion of the desert range. And you can see this pink shaded area, which is inside the refuge boundary, as well as this area. This is the area that was closed to hunters last year. This one is due to contaminants, so it's just for safety concerns. But this area has been due to security concerns with Area 51 creeping. Yeah. So um, this has brought this to um, attention both up the upper man of fish wildlife service but also to the congressionals because this is almost like an unauthorized access and closure of the refuge and we're trying to figure out why this is happening. So in the meantime, I've been working with the, the Secretary of Air Force office to try to get them <coughs> to at least do a, a check on Brent Seat because we don't know what the condition of it is. Um, and we're very concerned, especially after last year it was so dry, we had, we had several guzzlers go dry. And um, we're worried about that one going dry and potentially killing sheep. Um, so they're supposed to be 
helping do an on-site on -site inspection and doing repairs if necessary, but they haven't done that yet. And it's, it's been now a couple months, so we're getting to that point where we're going to have to do something to try to get out there on the ground and make it happen. So it's, just, it's been very difficult and frustrating. And then, and then the survey aspect of it. So now, Tendow will not be allowed to do surveys in that area of the desert range. And um, so one of the things we've asked for is if this is going to continue, and especially if we see changes in jurisdiction with the, the next withdrawal, that, they, that there's at least a camera on that guzzler so we can see what sheep are using it and try to get an estimate of population, but it's, it's been a very difficult situation. And on that, um, I'd like to take any questions. If there's anything you think I didn't cover, um, anything you can think of, just let me know. Any questions from the commission? <coughs> I don't have any. I covered everything. I mean, I have my list of things and notes and alternatives and timetable and, and things like that. So I very much appreciate uh, Mr. Dis Roberts the update and the information that you've provided. This will probably land on a future commission agenda again, I'm sure, as the timetable progresses. I know we've addressed this issue at least once before, if not several times. So. So, so basically, we don't know what's going to happen at the legislative level, and this is coming through the DOD, right? They're proposing the legislation. Um, I just was trying to relate back to the first couple times we visited um, this pro this change and project, and the purpose again was for acquiring more land for drones. Is that right? Or I'm trying to just understand. Um, the basic intent and why the land is needed overall. Okay, from what the Air Force has been telling us is they need more land to do more training. So right now they're restricted because um, the portion over desert is just for aerial training, except for those bombing areas. <clears throat> and they want more capability to do training on the ground um, throughout the entire range. And, and, the, and they're also, also looking for additional land to accommodate some of the training, especially with, I think, the new um, jet. Is it the F-35? There's, there's also a new jet to bring online to a new fighter. Um, so they're, but they want increased training capability. That's why they're looking at changing the, the jurisdiction and expanding it. So they want to change it basically from what it used to be to adding the on the ground components and also the thread emitters is a big one. So um, they're looking at installing um, thread emitters along using primarily existing roads, but, but they're gonna have to change a lot of the infrastructure to get the equipment out there. Cause these things are huge and they sit on a concrete base. And the purpose is to provide a simulated threat to the pilots who are doing the training. Like there's a hostile force on the ground that's gonna try to take them out from what they've explained to us. So they want us put these emitters all over the place in strategic locations and then also be able to land aircraft on the dry lakes, be able to drop off troops, do overland training um, exercises. But the biggest thing is they want that ready access um, to accommodate those training needs into the future. So we don't know what that, that's gonna be. You know, right now they're saying a 30% increase in training. You know, we don't know what that's gonna be in 10 or 15 or 20 years. You know, because the technology is evolving so quickly you know, and they can't be that specific because it is changing so much. So all we know is that it means changing the landscape on the refuge permanently. You know, if this is a, a pristine landscape that's going to be changed and impacted by their use of it. It's going to impact habitat for wildlife, bighorn sheep, desert tortoise, a whole bunch of other species. You know, and those changes are going to be constant. And uh, if one one of the a good way to, to see a good example of what it might look like is if you go on Google Earth and you can look at the North Range where they have more infrastructure and it is a spider web of roads and facilities out there and that we're going to see a similar spider web move down into the South Range. So, and, and it's, it is, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Do we 
ever did we ever put together any type of letter toward our uh, for our representatives in the legislature concerning this project? My recollection is there was a letter both respect to this proposal and Fallon that went out, I would say, two or three years ago. It was a while back. Um, and if my memory serves me correctly, a representative of the Air Force came to the meeting in Carson City and spoke for Department of Defense. Did not get the same type of input on the Fallon proposal. I'd have to go back and, and confirm that, and, but uh, that's my recollection. We have quite a few new participants now, though, since the 2018 election, and it might be noteworthy to, again, um, state some of our concerns as to wildlife in that area to the new elected officials so they understand um, some of our concerns once that legislate, legislative, um, you know, the, the law hits them for review, I think it would be maybe a good step to take. I mean, that is a huge change to the landscape up there. And I think at least our representatives should know exactly what's at stake, especially those that are newly elected. Secretary Wasley. Tony Lawson, for the record, I might add that uh, there was considerable discussion about both the Desert National Wildlife uh, Refuge and, and the impacts to expansion, as well as the Fallon um, testing training uh, complex uh, this past legislative session. There's also been um, our congressional delegation is fully aware. Uh, we visited with members of the delegation as, as recently as, as March um, in their offices, uh, both uh, Democrats, Republicans, uh, congressmen and women, senators are, are fully aware. It's an issue that's uh, repeatedly put in front of them. Um, and I can share with you uh, some of the legislation that was passed this, this past session uh, in opposition to this. So um, certainly you know, it would be appropriate for, for this body to take a, another uh, stance on it and it would just add to the body of, of evidence that already exists as, as far as the state's sentiment. Uh, the governor uh, has also weighed in and um, let his feelings be known um, relative to some of these um, proposed actions. So there, there is a high level, I, say, I share all that just to say there is a high level of awareness both within the state um, legislature as well as with Nevada's congressional delegation. Uh, however, um, you know, more of the same from this body wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Perhaps, um, I know this is an informational item, we're not doing action, but we'll do, uh, maybe put this on the list for the September meeting down in Las Vegas, since we'll be down in that part of the state in September for a potential action item for uh, for us to discuss what we, what we could do, uh, or a further communication that the commission may or may not want to send or something to that effect. Mr. Chairman, I might also um, add that on tomorrow's agenda, we will hear um, from the Fallon uh, complex, a representative from Fallon, to, to add some additional uh, items for consideration relative to military expansion in Nevada. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for the information. It's very informative on what's going on. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. I thank appreciate you. it. With that, uh, we'll move on to agenda item number seven, duck stamp request. Wildlife staff specialist Mike Zaraka and division administrator Alan Janay for possible action. The commission will review and may take action to approve up to $117,500 for projects submitted for fiscal year 2020. Funding from the duck stamp account, the specific duck stamp projects 
that may be approved are listed below. Do I need to read all those? Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. So, for the record, uh, Habitat Division Administrator Alan Janay, um, we have got a copy of the report up on the screen. Um, the report does have uh, some past completion reports um, for informational as far as things that have been done, unless the, the commission wish to hear or has any specific questions, we'll just kind of go straight to the uh, projects for consideration and approval. Um, I have them up on the screen. I'll actually slide a little further to the funding component. I'm getting that. Hang on. As far as the duck stamp account budget status, um, you have that handout, it's got that title at the top of the page, but it's also presented on the screen. The balance at the start of FY19 was $314,558. Um, revenue received during FY19 uh, from the duck stamp percentage off of the licenses was $90,082, minus the 2019 expenditures of $125, and minus the 10% administrative cost left an estimated balance at the end of FY19, start of FY20 for $270,632. Um, it's estimated that the revenue during 2020 will be somewhere near what we saw last year. We'll probably actually see a little bit of an increase. Um, but we, for this calculation, we estimated last year's number of 90,082. Um, again, minus those administrative costs. Um, with an expectation, if all approved projects were approved, it would decrease the balance by 117,500, leaving, if everything approved at the end of FY20 and all was spent, leaving a balance of 234,206 at the beginning of uh, FY21. So, given that information, uh, there's plenty of money for funding projects. And for the projects that are under consideration, um, there are six. Um, I can briefly go through uh, the title and the amount. Um, if you have any specific questions, we do have staff specialist Mike Zeratka to answer any questions, but um, if you like, I can read them off and give the amount or we can just consider them as a whole if you are fine that you can read the page and see the amount. I'm confident I can read the page and see the amount. <laughs> I'm confident that we can take this as a whole. Uh, You're confident? Good with it? I'm okay. fine unless someone has an objection. All right, so very, very quickly, like I said, there's six projects there. Um, you know, the first one, uh, avian nest success at Carson Lake. The other one, geotubes for Carson Lake. Uh, the third one was the conservation support for Dex Unlimited Wetland Work. Um, the Overton Pond Fence Project, Mason Valley Waterfowl Enhancement, and the Eastern WA uh, Weed Com or Eastern WMA Complex Weed. Uh, total amounting to 117,500. So that's what's been proposed. If there's any questions, mm -hmm. we can answer those. Any questions from the commission for Mr. Janay or Mr. Zaraka? Commissioner Hutz. I did have one and it's, um, well, I guess two. Uh, one of the issues I had um, was on or page two, the Overton, WMA, Pintel, and Wilson Pond leveling. Just in light of some of the information we've received concerning the botulism, it just seemed counterintuitive to level it out and um, make deeper areas shallow. So that really stuck out to me and I wanted to know why we were doing that in light of all of the stories we've had to hear about what happened with the shallow ponds up north this past summer. You bet, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Fellow commissioners, for the record, Mike Zaratka, Wildlife Area Staff Specialist. Um, 
That's a great question. Um, the two areas where we had botulism last year in Overton, I guess those two are separate areas. Um, Carson Lake was flooded up, and as the water dried up, it receded and created the shallow areas. What we did at Overton is we, we uh, kind of leveled the ponds, and we only fill those up with water in the fall of each year, so when botulism isn't an issue. And then those areas are used for waterfowl hunting, so the, the two areas are, are kind of not consistently the, the same management. So with the leveling, you're, you're fairly comfortable. I'm assuming you might have done this in the past and you have not seen botulism form in any of those areas in which you do leveling. Correct, yeah. And to add to that, Alan Janae, Habitat uh, Division Administrator, you know, these are managed systems, so the water we're bringing into this system is fresh water. And so a lot of times what you see in those uh, botulism events or that it's that stagnant sitting water um, that sat there the summer and kind of like he says is these are these are fall events that we're bringing in after that type of season right it just uh, not knowing all of that background information it just seems like we don't want to be part of the problem you know what I mean this upcoming summer so I just it seemed odd that we were doing that um, the other question we had is can we just go back and talk about we took um, took out a program where we had a competition for I thought it was art or duck stamps in the past and we weren't doing duck stamps or I'm confused this this must be different because it's ongoing and I was trying to get the distinction about the program we got rid of again and then what this program is <laughs> so if, if I might um, first first of all the the question may arise Where's duck stamp money coming from if we eliminated the stamp requirement? And so what we did in, uh, we had restricted reserve accounts that included the trap stamp, the state duck stamp, habitat uh, stamp. <clears throat> we looked at the percent of license dollars, the percent of licensees, the percent of the revenue across, uh, we calculated a seven year average so we got a percent of the revenue that was coming from state duck stamps. So we could continue these restricted reserve account, these special project funds. So the, the habitat improvement uh, funds, the, the uh, trout stamp funds, we still, upland game stamp funds, we still have these restricted reserve accounts, but rather than require hunters and anglers to purchase those things, we looked at the seven years prior to going away from those stamps and took those percentages and apply those to the total revenue to determine the available funds. Um, we also addressed the duck stamp art contest, the, the actual contest where uh, artists were uh, submitting uh, paintings to be judged and one would be selected to actually be put on that stamp. And that was a whole separate issue, uh, but participation uh, was very low, it was no longer required to have the physical stamp, you could have electronic stamps, there was a number of reasons that drove participation down on that. So um, kind of a separate issue, but the decision was made to go, go away from the duck stamp art competition simultaneous with the determination to go away from the requirement for the stamp, but we still have the money as based on the percent of uh, average percent from the previous seven years. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And I'll just add that I think one of the topics of conversation when we did the license simplification was that both the duck stamp projects and the upland game stamp projects would continue even though we weren't requiring people to buy the stamps anymore, but we'd still have the projects based upon the formula and have the money available for the projects. So. Any additional questions or comments? This is an action item. Is there any public comment on the duck stamp project proposals? Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Paul Dixon Clark uh, the question and concern raised at our cab was is that if you look at the estimates of costs and money that we're going to allocate 
they seem to be ROM estimates because there's no justification for that estimate in these things or in the Upland Game Bird for exactly how you got that number. Since they're all rounded numbers to things, somebody raised a concern that we were being a little loose with how we were allocating funds since we were either going to be over or under. And if we were under in funding, does the funds get reverted back to the duck stamp account or does it go somewhere else? And I got questions that I could not ask. I got asked but could not answer, so I thought I'd raise them here and there'd be clarity at the commission level at your leisure or from end out to me directly. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Steve Marcus, why fine. Um, it was asked at our uh, uh, meeting uh, about this Ducks Unlimited Wetlands Conservation Support. Um, they were wondering what does that benefit? Power ducks down here. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Mr. Janetti, I, I know the contribution to Ducks Unlimited comes up, um, and we can address that, and perhaps you could address the comments from the Clark Cab as well. I'll for the record, Alan Janay, uh, I will cover the Clark Cab question. The numbers that are put forward in this is, remember they are just a piece of the, the request that is submitted here is only a piece of the total project cost. Um, we bring other monies to this. Um, sometimes there's habitat conservation fees, sometimes it lays within the grant. So that's why the numbers are rounded often. It's just in simplicity in presenting the numbers um, and knowing that there are other dollars that will make up the fine, you know, sense of, of the proposals. Um, as far as the unspent dollars, these are basically reimbursements. As we make payment, you know, there's $10,000 set aside for a specific project. As we incur those costs, we code to it, and only the, the money that is allocated to that is hit. If that money is not spent to that project code, it stays within the duck stamp balance and is there for future funding. So if it is not spent, it stays within the balance and the project gets closed and then it's available for future funding. And Mike Zorotko will take the piece about the Ducks Unlimited funding. You bet, thanks. Mike Zorotka, for the record, uh, the Ducks Unlimited wetland support, these funds are submitted to Ducks Unlimited to, uh, and they contribute to projects and enhancements, um, activities for the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, which includes all of Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Endow recommends that these funds be used in Canada since uh, our banding studies show that Alberta and Saskatchewan provide important nesting and breeding habitat for waterfowl. These waterfowl then migrate through Nevada and benefit our waterfowl hunters. So. Um, do you uh, do you would utilize those funds wherever we suggest but I mean, that's what we feel is the best results for for our waterfowl hunters and DU also matches these funds three to one and they, we've been doing this contribution for 20 years so I hope that answers the question mr. chairman I might also add um, staff specialist Zirak I mentioned the North American waterfowl management plan AWAMP um, last year, Nevada was the recipient of a NACA grant, a North American Waterfowl Conservation Act grant that was put together, the proposal was put together by Ducks Unlimited um, for Lawton Valley Wetlands. And that was a $900,000 grant for Lawton Valley Wetlands. So the amount of money that Nevada has contributed to Ducks Unlimited for the production of waterfowl that are coming through Nevada and to Nevada as staff specialist Zaraka indicated, is is still it's been probably 15, 16 years at ten thousand dollars a year, 150, 160 thousand, and in one year we just received almost a million dollar NACA grant consistent with the North American Waterfowl Management Plan in a project proposal that was put together, built by Ducks Unlimited uh, for the benefit of the Hunton Valley wetlands. So it is a it is a partnership. Uh, Waterfowl, shorebirds use a significant portion of North America and to try to spend the little waterfowl uh, stamp dollars we have in the boundaries of Nevada wouldn't pay nearly the dividends 
to waterfowl coming through our state as they do when we can invest them in the duck factories, the Perry Pothole uh, region of, of the north. Commissioner Hubs? I remembered I just had two more kind of uh, questions I that came to mind. One was in regard to the herbicide uh, projects. Um, I saw that state statute um, asked that the state keep noxious weeds off of the wildlife management areas. I just wanted to know if there was any harm to water quality or surrounding wildlife um, from the herbicide application. And then the, the second question I had was on the project with the fencing to keep the um, burrows and wild horses off of the, out of the water resources, if that in fact keeps other game animal uh, from accessing the, wild, uh, the water sites there. You bet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mike Zarachter for the record again. In regards to the herbicides and the applications, um, everything that we apply is, uh, is done in accordance with the label and the law. So everything that we use around the wetlands is approved for that type of use, so there is no, no effects to other wildlife um, with the herbicides. And then uh, for the Pintail Wilson, um, the fencing around those areas, no, there's no other impacts to to wildlife, we do construct wildlife friendly fence, which is you know, four strands. <clears throat> um, top and bottom are usually smooth wire. I'm not sure what the specs are down at Overton at this point, because the, you know, the funds haven't been approved. But once that, once if it is approved, then we will um, make our, our wildlife fence um, in accordance with what we need. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none. Motion. We did do pu all public comment, correct? I believe. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, Doug Stamp request uh, for uh, dated June 2019 for uh, as presented by the department. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner McNinch, seconded by Commissioner Hubs, to approve the duck stamp request as presented by the department. Everyone clear on the motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. With that, um, I think I need to take a quick break. Someone gave me this huge styrofoam cup this morning that I filled three times. So let's reconvene at uh, 11.25, please.